um, to, to this event. Um, and we're so thrilled about that, but we do know that some people will be coming early. And as you've all learned over Zoom these past two years, people do kind of have to come and go with these meetings and we completely understand that. So we just are thrilled that you're all here joining us. I am April Bedford. I'm the Dean of the School of Education here at Brooklyn College. And I am so delighted um, uh, to be hosting this event. Believe me, I did no planning, none of the work. So I really do want to recognize um, the work of our wonderful Asian and Ama Asian American faculty in the School of Education. And, um, and they will introduce other uh, members of Brooklyn College faculty who also helped plan the event. But I particularly want to recognize from our early childhood program, our early childhood and art education department, um, Professor Lulu Song and Professor uh, Lisa Lee, Ja Lee, and um, Professor Shaheen Usmani um, from our Department of Childhood Bilingual and Special Education, Professor Wim Song Hu, Professor Norman Ng, and Professor Yoon Ju Lee, and from our Secondary Education Department, Professor Howard Zhang. Um, I just want to let you know that I really didn't even know that this event was in, in the works until particularly Professor Lee and Professor Song uh, let me know when it was all fully planned and they had done all of the leg, leg work to, um, to invite our outstanding panelists and just to plan this excellent event for uh, Amer uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander AAPI Heritage Month. So uh, it was a thrill for me to get to see that uh, initial email and to find out what they had been working on. And now all of their hard work has come to fruition and we're so thrilled about that. So I just want to take a moment to recognize our panelists for this evening and then um, different members of the faculty will be introducing each of them in more detail before they speak. Um, but I do, as you probably saw on the invitation, our panelists tonight are uh, New York State Senator John Liu. Uh, he will be joining us a little bit later and we'll be here for the question and answer portion of the event, but um, he is not uh, able to join us right at the very beginning. Then we have uh, Professor Ying Liu, and she is an Associate Professor of Applied Statistics, Social Science, and Humanities at NYU. And she's also a board member of Make Us Visible New Jersey. And I think that the, the title of that organization speaks for itself, but you will be learning more about that in, in greater detail in just a few moments. Um, uh, Unfortunately, Mark Traeger was not able to join us, but a member of the team from the New York City Department of Education um, working on uh, making AAPI history and um, students more visible uh, is Joe Schmidt, who is with us. And then finally, uh, Michaela Lynn and Michaela is a sophomore at Stuyvesant High School, and she is the founder of a nonprofit called Read Nation. Um, and again, we'll learn a little bit more about that. I don't want to steal anybody else's thunder. So welcome all of you. Thank you so much for agreeing um, panelists to to share your time with, and your expertise with us. I know we're going to be talking about issues and concerns that are very important to all of us and that have unfortunately been, um, you know, uh, a result of some, some very sad and tragic happenings over the past couple of years. And uh, so we are here to both celebrate and learn and find out ways that all of us can contribute to making all of our AAPI, AAPI community more visible, more included, and safer. So thank you all for being here. And I will turn it over to you, Lisa. All right. Thank you, April, for your wonderful introduction. And I also thank you for your warm and a tremendous support for our work and for the AAPI community. 
I also want to thank uh, Professor Jacqueline Shannon, my department chair. Thanks for your strong support along the way. And my uh, dear colleagues at the uh, School of Education, the staff members, thanks for spreading out the words, inviting your students or just being here today. It is great support. Um, I also want to thank the uh, uh, panelists. Thanks for each of you. Without you, this event wouldn't happen. <laughs> yeah, and uh, for all the audience, and uh, you are our colleagues, our students, our friends, the parents, the community workers, all of you, thanks for taking the time to join us. Uh, it is you who will define the um, and expand the purpose and the impact of today's event. Um, so this event is supported by the Asian, Asian American Faculty and Staff uh, Association at Brooklyn College. I want to, um, a big thanks to Ms. Su Fan Wu, who is the co-chair for this association. She's not here today, but, uh, but uh, she has been a big help. So I also want to thank Dr. Diana Pan, um, the chair of the association. Thanks for inspiring us and the planning with us. And Dr. Pan is here with us today. Dr. Pan, do you want to give us a remark? <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. And um, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank Professors Lee and Song and Dean Bedford and the School of Ed for putting, hosting this very important and timely conversation. Um, so I'm Diana Pan, I'm a professor of sociology, but also co-chair of the Asian American Faculty and Staff Association at Brooklyn College, which we have just celebrated our one year anniversary. We just we were just formed last year. So this is all very um, thrilling. Um, I just want to share a little bit, you know, as most folks here may know, Brooklyn College is currently working on introducing AAPI studies curriculum. Um, this last fall, fall of 2021, was the first time we actually taught a class at the college that centered the experiences of, of um, Asian Americans. Um, but this initiative has lasted three decades, right? So I think the broader question we have to ask ourselves is why? Why has it, why has it taken so long? for um, an institution of higher education to offer its first class in fall of 2021 with regard to AAPI experiences. As New Yorkers, our kids are not taught holistic AAPI history in our schools. I can count the number of AAPI authors my eighth grade daughter has been exposed in the classroom since kindergarten, and that number is two, right? We supplement at home, but not all kids have this exposure. And so we are um, robbing our children, our New Yorkers, right, of this uh, curriculum. Given the sociocultural environment of the past two years where AAPIs are scapegoated and attacked, New Yorkers are not equipped to not only understand, but actually critically engage with the social history. A history belonging not just to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but all Americans, right? Scapegoating is, is very much a part of Asian America since um, our, our history in this country. So I want to thank the panelists here, seriously, from the bottom of my heart for your continued work and advocacy. And um, thank you all for, um, for attending this important event, for caring and for being here to learn. Thanks so much. Thank you, Diana, for your strong and uh, inspiring message. Um, you know, Asian Americans have been one of the earliest immigrants in the United States but our stories, contributions, impacts uh, in the past or today have been mostly erased or distorted or marginalized. That is dangerous. As you can see what happened today, the surge of anti-Asian crime and violence uh, in the city across the nation. And this is simply not right because injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. Last year, I read this book. I'm going to share screen. Um, sorry. Uh, it's called Dreaming Out. By John Felser. The stories were shocking for me. So I have heard about the notorious um, 
uh, Chinese Exclusion uh, Act, but I had no idea about the heinous and outrageous crimes and violence inflicted upon the early Chinese immigrants. So many of them were killed by gun or burned or mutilated, head on gallows or linked. So um, at, a, at a Truckee, a town of California, where the uh, Chinese immigrants who built the transcontinental roads lived, their Chinatown were, uh, was burned and they rebuilt and was burned again. And um, there were five times burning down uh, in like 10 years. And there were more than 200 those roundups from 1849 to 1906. But what inspired, uh, inspired, inspired me the most is this. But the Chinese fought back. They filed the first lawsuit for reparations in the United States, sued for the restoration of their property, prosecuted white vigilance, demanded the right to own land, and years before Brown and the Board of Education won access to public education for their children. In 1893, more than 1,000 Chinese Americans refused the government's order to wear photo identity cards to prove their legal status. The largest mass civil disobedience in United States uh, history to that point. So that is my experience of learning a piece of AAPI history, or I should say learning a piece of American history. I got inspired and encouraged. And that is one of the reasons why I advocate for the AAPI history in school curriculum. So tonight, um, our panelists will share their stories, experiences, or their support and work on the AAPI history in curriculum. Uh, so here's the agenda. Um, so Professor Lulu Sun and Professor Ng will facilitate the discussion. So now let me give the let's give the time to the panel. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you very much, Dean Bradford. Thank you, Professor Lee. Again, a warm and heartfelt welcome to everyone um, who shows up here um, for your support, for your um, passion for the topic, um, for your care. Um, our first speaker tonight is Dr. Ying Lu. Dr. Ying Lu is an associate professor of applied statistics, social science and humanities at New York University. She is also a board member of Make Us Visible New, New Jersey. Dr. Liu had lived in New York City for more than a decade before moving to New Jersey, and her children had attended NYC public schools for many years. So she has had abundant um, experiences as an Asian resident and parent in both states. Welcome, Dr. Liu. Um, we're very honored to have you tonight. Um, tonight, Dr. Liu will be sharing with us what um, their project make up make us visible New Jersey is and what do they advocate and what have they um, what does the make us visible New Jersey do to facilitate the implementation of the newly passed New Jersey curriculum bill and heritage bill um, we're very um, eager to hear um, what Dr. Liu has to share welcome uh, thank you, Professor Song, for your nice introduction. I'm honored to be here. And thank you, Dean Bafford and uh, Professor Lee for your uh, uh, great comments, remarks. And uh, it's really, uh, I feel very honored that I get this chance to, to share some of my thoughts and experiences with colleagues at CUNY. Uh, so let me start. I, I prepared some slides, you know, we're academia, right? so we have to have slides. <laughs> Let's see, um, I'm gonna do a slideshow. Right, so uh, this evening I'm going to share with you some of my experiences are involved in the Asian American uh, Pacific Islander cur curriculum advocacy work in New Jersey. So uh, I'm mostly speaking in my role as a uh, advocate <laughs> 
a member of Makers Visible New Jersey. But uh, before I start, I also wanna share a little bit from a BIMIN perspective, because this is also my uh, participatory research. So when I got in, I didn't quite realize how uh, rewarding and enriching this experience has been. It's had been an incredible journey. So I have, uh, I'm a faculty member at NYU Steinhardt. So, uh, and my, my research expertise in applied statistics quantitative method. And I've been doing research in various fields in the past uh, five, seven years, I started looking at education. So I'm actually very familiar with uh, NYC DOE student data. <laughs> but one of the things that's not very satisfying is I, never seen what how public education actually works. So when I, we moved to New, uh, New Jersey, as uh, Lulu said, I've lived in New York for many years, but we moved to New Jersey a, couple, a, a year before COVID. And uh, I guess it's the silver lining of COVID. So I get to spend a lot of time because of remote, uh, I got to spend a lot of time in New Jersey. And uh, that also affords me with a lot of time and effort to, to do this advocacy work. And, and I, it's truly remarkable and it really enriched my understanding about education system and education policy. So uh, just a pitch, right? I think for all academians, we should <laughs> go outside our- I was just like calling my mom like all day. Our um, uh, okay. office, right, to see how the you know things work in school and the, the education system. Uh, since I'll be, I'm speaking on behalf of as a, a board member of Makers Visible New Jersey. Uh, let me first start uh, just say a couple of things about our group. So we are a group of uh, we're a grassroots group. Of, uh, we're not even incorporated. So uh, this group was started with a group of parents and student educators and professionals. Uh, founded in spring 2021, shortly after the uh, Atlanta shooting, because that was like where you see how community awareness about uh, the, the rise of anti-Asian hate crimes and uh, there's a lot of uh, conversations and the, the like awakening, right? People started looking at, rethinking about our re racial identity and, and the whole bunch of things. So uh, our when we found this group, our mission is to um, support API curriculum development and to uh, also advocate for New Jersey legislation to uh, mandate to, to include API contents in K-12 uh, schools. And also uh, we're, we wanted to build a broad coalition to support open access to resources for educators to, to implement such curriculum within their classroom. And since we founded last spring, we have actually done a, a, a lot of work. And uh, also thank for the, the Asian American community in New Jersey, uh, a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm and the people really into this work. So we were able to mobilize thousands of people in the Asian American communities and ally allies across New Jersey and we, we embarked this incredible legislative <laughs> advocacy and ensured passing of two legislations. One is uh, the, the, to mandate API curriculum in, in New Jersey public schools. And also uh, another, there's a second uh, legislation is to uh, establish Asian American Heritage Commission and New Jersey DOE to oversee the, implement, oversee the implementation of the API curriculum. And uh, in this process, we were also able to build a broad coalition that include uh, student community members and the uh, professionals, legislators representing and celebrating the diversity among Asian Americans and Americans. In it. And uh, also we've been partnering with over uh, 40 organizations and connected to many professional associations in the education space. Uh, including uh, New Jersey uh, Education Association, the Teachers Union, and uh, Association of uh, uh, School Principals, and the, the BO Board of Education uh, uh, Association. And also, uh, after the passing of the curriculum, because the second step is 
how you implement the curriculum. You, just having the law is far from enough to, to deliver the con curriculum contents into the classroom. So our, our current work is to help develop a teacher professional training courses. And we've just added four professional training and development courses uh, in collaboration with New Jersey uh, NGEA. Uh, so here are over on the right side are the four uh, PD courses we just added and, uh, and are being currently offered. And this is also just a quick, uh, our members of uh, Make Us Visible New Jersey, and this is Dr. Connie Langevin. She's a psychiatrist and she's the founder and the soul of this movement. And uh, also, as you can see, we are a pan-Asian group. We, the, our members uh, include uh, many different uh, countries of origins and represent different faiths and different occupations. I mean, um, so, uh, all right, so that's about uh, Make Us Visible New Jersey. I see there's some comments in the chat. Let me take a look. Oh, okay. Um, since I think not everyone here, I mean, I noticed we have a lot of uh, Asian Americans uh, in the audience. And also uh, there's, I mean, just, I, I think, I, let, let me actually share a little bit facts about the Asian American Pacific Islanders in today's America. Uh, we just, the after census 2020, right, the data actually reveals that the Asian American population and the Pacific Islanders population are experiencing very fast growth. And this group is the fastest growing group in the past decade. And now uh, we account for 7.7% .7 of the US population. And number wise, uh, Asian alone, uh, there's 20 million in, which is a 35 increase from 2010 uh, census. And we also see a, a rise in the Asian mixed race group, 4 million of them, 55% increase. And the Pacific Islanders and native Hawaiians, 30% increase. And in the meantime, and we see there's a, a decline of white population and the black and the like mixed race and Hispanic and Latinx, also uh, the populations on the rise. So overall, right, as, as we know that the Americans becoming more diverse as we go. Um, and also for uh, Asian American population growth. So here I'm borrowing this figure from Pew Research Center and it reveals a very, very interesting pattern as a, so as a Professor Lee said, right, the, the history, the, history of Asian Americans actually started in the 1600s. That's when the first record documented Filipino landed in the America. But this chart started with 1870 because that's that's the, because uh, uh, further early on, there's not as much. So uh, as you can see, there's for a good 100 years, there's very slow in Asian American population growth. Uh, the background of this, as many of you probably know, is Asian. Uh, it's the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Asian uh, and the exclusion of Asian immigrants in general. And then in the 1960s, with the passing of uh, uh, Immigration and Nationality Act, right, that's when the U.S. opened door to uh, Asian uh, immigrants. And ever since then, the population of Asian Americans just went on a, a dramatic increase. Right. And today, when we think about Asian Americans, we are not a monolithic group. Uh, although the Chinese American accounts for a large percentage of Asian American, 24%. I think in New York City, we may even have a higher percentage because we have a couple of several Chinatown with a lot of people. And the Indian American is, are the second largest group followed by Filipinos, uh, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese Americans. But then there are also uh, a lot of Asian Americans from various countries and regions of origins. And we celebrate a numerous culture and ethnic heritage. And in the meantime, and this data also, recent data also show that right in this trend, uh, the Asian American youth actually is, is the fastest grow, growing group 
among Asian Americans. And this also reflects in public school student enrollment. Uh, I'm just pulling out some data in New Jersey, but uh, so uh, in New Jersey today, we have 12% 12, 12 of public school students are Asian American, which is about 150,000 of them. But however, there's only fewer than 2% of Asian American teachers and uh, principals and leaderships and staff. Uh, so uh, we have, despite a large number of uh, Asian American students in public school, right? There's not enough teachers, uh, Asian American teachers and the, the leaders. On the other hand, uh, the Asian American curriculum contents has been completely left off in school curriculum. Uh, when I took a closer look of the current New Jersey social studies guidelines, in, the, in that 96 page document, the term of Asian American was only mentioned once. And uh, it was also not specifically referring to Asian American history. And also, uh, on the other hand, if you look at readings, you look at uh, books in the English language classes, students read, right? There's a, we don't see as much AAPI authors and the AAPI theme books. I also want to offer a little bit data. Today, actually, 10% of the uh, youth literacy authors are AAPI, but we, we don't see that get re represented in the books our students read. And uh, so, uh, so that's the, the reality, right? And I wanna also, uh, I think Professor Lee already mentioned about the history. So I'm just gonna do a couple of slides on the history, the landmark events as a, just to remind everybody, right? Cause we're advocating, advocating for AAPI curriculum and uh, a large chunk of that, it's about Asian American history and it's about Asian American history as part of integral part of the US history. Uh, so uh, I'm showing that same population growth trend and I overlay a few uh, important events here. Uh, so on this figure, right, this is just remind everybody the history of Asian American uh, is a history of constantly experiencing of xenophobia and racism. Uh, in the in, 19, in the 1860s, when there was actually, I think the statistics said there was somewhere close to 60,000 transcontinental railroad Chinese laborers. And they also helped build the, the most difficult part of the, uh, the railroad that's on the west side. And, uh, but um, but the, the, work, the, lab, the workers were exploited and also when transcontinental railroad was complete and all the Chinese laborers were left off in, uh, in the celebration. And also uh, at, there was also, this is also the period of rise of Chinese exclusion. So as Professor Lee mentioned about 1870, uh, Los Angeles massacre and, but not just in Los Angeles, a lot of Chinatown back then got burned down and people were killed. And as a result, actually, the, the Chinese immigrants were forced to the East Coast. And the first Chinatown on the East Coast, it's actually in New Jersey, Belleville, which was a group of Chinese laborers were forced out from the West. And then, then we have New York Chinatown. <laughs> um, so a, a, around the same time, the, the Chinese exclusion become institutionalized as law. So the Page Act, uh, prevents Asian American women to, to come into the country. It's, and then, then officially then move to Chinese Exclusion, Exclusion Act. So Chinese Exclusion Act is the, the only law in the US that denies uh, citizenship immigration based on country of origin. And then as history un moves forward, right, then coupled with the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, anti-Asian, so the terms of yellow peril, right, and colonial pathology, those co terms are coined to portray Asian Americans as, uh, as a lower class people, right? And uh, then in the further, right, then we think about another big landmark event is in the 1940s during the Second World War, where the Japanese Americans 
their loyalty was questioned and the tens of thousands of Japanese Americans were either forced out of the country or put in the uh, internment camps in the US. But then in the 1950s, there was a McCarthyism and Red Scare and a lot of prosecutions on the uh, Chinese American scientists, right? So um, in, even we look at more, right, over more recently, post 9-11, the South Asian Americans also experience hate crimes. And more recently, right, as we all know, because of the COVID and the, the, chi the, the China xenophobia, Asian xenophobia is coming back and then the China virus and China act, the terms fueled into a rising Asian hate crimes. But on the other hand, right, when we look at a history of Asian American, then it's also a history of resistance and fights for civil rights. Uh, in the 1870s, right, the, around the Chinese Inclusion Act, um, uh, Tape versus Hurley, a girl, who, she sued San Francisco School District for segregation, once equal education rights. In 1898, Wang Kim Art sued U United States all the way to Supreme Court for a birth citizenship right. So for uh, many of us, I guess, if you were not born in the US, your children born in the US and have the citizenship and we should all thank for Wong Kim Art. And then during the, uh, at Japanese internment time, uh, there's also uh, Jap uh, people fought, fought for civil rights, the Nono Boys group, right? And then during the 1960s, the Asian Americans joined the civil rights movement uh, with the uh, with the other uh, uh, civil rights uh, uh, joined the civil rights movement, and this is also the term the, the time when the yellow power and also the term uh, Asian Americans being coined at the time, and you also start seeing uh, student activists in college on college campus. Then in the nineteen eighties. Uh, this Ch Chinese man, Vincent Ching, he was killed uh, by two uh, white men in the Detroit but because he was mistaken as a Japanese worker. And then the contact was, there was this uh, anti-Japanese sentiment because they're afraid of the Japanese cars gonna take over American manufacturing industry. So Vincent Ching was beat to death, but then the two white men walked away with no penalty. So this sparked a, a, a decades of justice of Vincent Chen, a protest and the involvement of uh, Asian American civil rights movement. And then if we look at even today, right, there's a lot of, you see anti-Asian hate protests and also more advocacy for diversity, equity and inclusion in schools and workplace. And I myself was also inspired by, by this movement. So uh, when we look at this history, right? And the history, it seems like happened in the past, but it has implications of what happens today. And uh, here I'm just listing some of the impacts for, for our students, right? Or the Asian American people. So because of that yellow peril uh, uh, notion, it's still haunting the Americans, right? And uh, as, with the COVID, right, as COVID China virus, and you just see anti-Asian hate crime increase dramatically. And, uh, and this number is quite shocking. One of my colleagues, a friend, uh, Professor Cixin Wang from University of Maryland, she conducted a survey earlier uh, last year about Chinese American student experience during COVID. And she found that one in three Chinese American students have experienced and witnessed verbal attacks uh, in person or on the internet during COVID. And uh, this whole, the history also, right, the, the history as a Chinese exclusion act, people see Asian Americans forever foreigners in this uh, leads to the othering and invisibility in schools, which increase race-based bullies and uh, hurt the identity of, especially racial identities for Asian American students and leads to a mental health impact. Uh, okay, so I need to go faster. Uh, all right, so, and another thing, note issue is with uh, model minority. 
is the model minority myth, where Asians are seen as the lack of leadership, good work, working bees, right? And this also leads to narrow career pathways for Asian American students and damage their uh, civic belonging and sense of civic engagement. So our group, we believe that education is an anecdote to hate. And in particular, we very much agree and embrace this concept as the curriculum as windows and mirrors. If you give, offer the right curriculum, curriculum students, diverse students of diverse background can see themselves reflected in the curriculum. And the other student can also see uh, different students through curriculum as a window to expand their world. So uh, if, we if we can diversify curriculum, all student benefits. And this here, I'm just giving you also a quick, a little bit example of what AAPI curriculum means and also the resources. Among many resources, Asian American Education Project offers many lesson plans. And uh, the notion is we want to be infusion rather than insertion as a, here's one unit of Asian American history. So we're looking for AAPI contents to be introduced by disciplinary concept and thematic unit. And uh, you should check out the story of Patsy Mink, who's the first Asian American Congresswoman. And her story reflects uh, topics about civics, government, and civil rights, and, and uh, also, also advocating for AAPI, uh, sh we should think about go beyond US history. As we mentioned already in English language arts, we should expand readings, right? And also in world history, we need to diversify and have different perspectives and sources move beyond Euro-centered uh, framework. Uh, and similar things can be done in foreign language and science. All right. And lastly, I also want to say uh, when we advocate for AAPI curriculum uh, inclusion, it doesn't mean we want to take away other curriculum contents. We, we like to expand the horizon, enrich the contents, right, and remove the existing biases. So in New Jersey, we also work with Amstead Commission, uh, which is who are dedicated teaching black history and the LGBTQI curriculum and the Holocaust curriculum. And we hope also down the road, we can see more uh, curriculum diversification. All right, that's, sorry, it's taking too long, I guess. Thank you so much, Dr. Ying. Thank you for such an informative um, presentation with so much data and um, facts. It's very inspiring. So in the interest of time, we'll just take one quick question. There will be a general Q&A session after all panelists have presented. Is there any uh, quick question that um, anyone wants to ask? You can feel free to just unmute yourself and then shout out. Okay. If not, um, I, I would say um, we will move on to the next panelist and then save the time. I do have questions for Dr. Liu, but I think maybe it's better that we save it um, towards the end um, to have a more extended discussion. All right, I'll turn the floor to uh, Dr. Ng um, to introduce our next uh, panelist. Thank you, uh, Dr. Song, so much for that. And uh, thank you, Dr. Liu, for really giving us a foundation as well as a, some context for why we need this panel in the first place. Uh, really appreciate that. So let's move on to our second guest. Uh, we have Ms. Michaela Lin. So as uh, you heard from Dean Bedford, Ms. Ms. Lin uh, is a sophomore in high school. And uh, thank you, Ms. Lin, for joining us today. Uh, you've clearly accomplished a lot in your time as a high school student. Can you tell us a little bit about why it's so important to teach about the history of Asian American and Pacific Islanders in New York City public schools and perhaps schools in general, especially from the perspective of a student? Uh, would you uh, be able to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me just share my slides. All right. Okay, so hello, my name is Michaela and I'm a sophomore at Stuyvesant High School. And I'm also one of the co-founders of Read Nation. 
And since we're talking about history today, I'd like to first quote someone really old, like more than 2,000 years old. Confucius. Yes, that Confucius. If you can read Chinese, the characters read, improve, your fa improve yourself, help your family, govern your country, world peace. Pretty ambitious. But following along with this, my talk today will be about me, my family, and my country. And I think I'm a bit out of my depth with world peace, but maybe someday. For the experts out there, yes, Confucius doesn't actually mean family as in the modern sense, but actually feud as in feudalism. So more like Queens, New York City, neighbors, community, like the metaphorical family. So about me, I was born in Whittier, California 16 years ago, and my parents came to the States in the early 90s, but my family's roots in America actually go back a little further. So my great great uncle em emigrated from China from China to the US in the 60s to further his education while his brother my great grandpa was being tortured during the cultural revolution in mainland China. In 1980 as soon as US China relationship normalized my great great uncle got his brother my great grandpa and the family out of China as fast as immigration services allowed. Then came the rest of the extended family later in the early 90s. Learning about my family's history gives me an anchor point and a sense of continuity. Learning about the determination and persistence that my family displayed while fighting for the American dream makes me feel so much closer to these people I've never even met. It also fills me with a sense of pride that my country is worth all this struggle, and I truly agree that it is. So that last slide was just about the family of my dad's grandparents. Now let's talk about my last name, Lin. So I'm the 43rd generation of Lins, and you're probably wondering, how do you know that and who decided to count this? Well, the family book tells me so. So this version here was published in March of 2015. So unfortunately, there are no archaic fancy Lansons scrolls. I was pretty disappointed too. But it has a lot of history in here. And it only covers the Lin family in Yungtai County, a small county of about 400,000 people in Fujian province. On it, it says, my uncle, my dad, and my aunt are the 42nd generation of Lins. They actually got my dad's birth year and career wrong. He's not quite that old, but don't worry, it'll get fixed on the next print. So I'm the 43rd generation. And thanks to China's one child policy, girls actually get to be listed on this book at last. Before this version, only guys got to be in this and you can already see my aunt's name on it or so I'm told. My Chinese does leave a lot to be desired. So my name can also get recorded for the very small price of a 13 hour flight. And I'll be listed with 42 generations of Lins before me. That's more than 800 years of history. And it would have been longer too if it wasn't for a forced migration from Northern China to Fujian province during the Song Dynasty. Unfortunately, the records prior to that were lost, but according to historical record, one of the ancestors of the Lin family is Bi Gang, a historical figure in the Shang Dynasty more than 3000 years ago. By now you can probably sense how much my family values history. My genealogy is older than Queen Elizabeth. And history gives me, gives me a sense of pride, but more importantly, a sense of belonging from understanding where I come from. History is not something dead and over. It is always alive, always growing, always unfinished. Credits to John F. Kennedy for that quote. It captures a lot of how knowledge I shared with you guys was passed down to me from my dad. He told me about he, how he and his family came to this country. He showed me the pictures of the Lin family book, courtesy of WeChat photos, of course. Without him talking about it, I would not have known about my family's journey to this country. Without him talking about it, the family book would just be a pile of paper collecting dust somewhere. And my dad, he learned this history from his dad, who learned it from his grandparents. History needs to be talked about, taught to the next generation. Otherwise, it just fades away silently. This is why we need to teach AAPI history in school. We need to teach about Wong Kim Ark 
and without him, I would not be an American citizen. Wong Kim Ark was born in California, just like me. He was born in San Francisco in 1873 to Chinese immigrant parents, and his parents were age 15 ineligible to be naturalized due to the 1870 Naturalization Act, which limits American citizenship to white people and people of African descent, barring Asians from U.S. citizenship. And on Wong's second return from China, he was denied entry because he wasn't considered a even though he was literally born in California. He was confined for five months on steamships off the coast of San Francisco. And finally, in 1898, in a landmark 6-2 decision, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of Wong. They decided that the 14th Amendment does make him a U.S. citizen by birthright. Henceforth, the citizenship of children born in the U.S. is guaranteed. He opened the door for so many future Americans, and his fight directly relates to why I can confidently say I am an American. You see, AAPI history is American history. Amer Asian Americans have made so many contributions to America since the founding. In fact, we've been in America before America was even a thing, starting from Filipino immigrants in the late 16th century. And then there was another huge wave during the 19th century to Hawaii, which is shown above. Um, yet, this perception that we are always fresh immigrants keeps on staying and sticking. And that's why it's so important to teach AAPI history. It combats the idea that we are any less American than anyone else. We are part of America, not the separate model minority group. Nope, we are fully and firmly part of America's history and it should be taught as such. Another interesting part of AAPI history is Dr. Chen Chung Wu, also known as the Chinese Marie Curie, or the first lady of physics research, which to say a lot about her. Dr. Wu was born in 1912 and grew up in a time way before girls had just as much access to education as boys. Despite all of that, she went on to study physics in Taiwan, immigrate to America in 1936, and earn a PhD from UC Berkeley. In 1956, Dr. Wu was approached by fellow physicists Sung Dao Li and Chen Ning Yang to design an experiment that would confirm the non-conservation of parity during beta decay. Some important science stuff, I'm guessing. And her experiment did exactly that. And it also earned a Nobel Prize for Li and Yang in the following year. Like the contributions of many women in science at the time, Dr. Wu's work was not acknowledged by the Nobel Committee. She went on to make many more contributions to science. Later, Wolf Foundation Prive Prize Committee recognized her contribution by awarding her the Wolf Prize for Physics in, 17, in 1978. I grew up without seeing many people like me in history books and not really feeling represented while learning about this in school and in media. And for a while, I kind of just thought that maybe there weren't notable people in America's history that looked like me. But that's so far from the truth. We need to teach Dr. Wu's stories in schools because she's a perfect role model, not just for Asian American girls, for all girls that love science. History teaches us about passion and it helps illuminate the path forward. In school, we were taught about Japanese internment camps and the Chinese Exclusion Acts, but there was maybe a paragraph and a really short one at that. Only when I did the research for this talk did I find out that they were only given 48 hours before they had to relocate. I imagine my ancestors probably got similar treatment when they were forced to migrate to southern China. I can't imagine the chaos, the emotional damage that was done. Then we had to wait another 44 years for the U.S. Congress to finally pass the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, signed by President Reagan, acknowledging the injustice of internment apologizing for it and providing uh, reparations. History teaches us that there are, teach, history teaches us painful lessons, so hopefully we won't repeat it. And yet it has been repeating. With the recent increase in hate crimes that Dr. Liu also talked about. But Another thing we also learned out about was the Chinese Exclusion Act, but what we didn't learn was a long-lasting impact. It was passed initially 
10 years for 10 years, but then it got extended 51 years longer, and only because China was an ally during World War II. And even then, quotas of 105 Chinese immigrants a year were still in place. And it wasn't until the Immigration Act of 1990 that set the flexible worldwide cap based on a variety of factors. The 1990 Immigration Act was the basis for my dad's family's immigration to the U.S. My dad had to wait 12 years to be reunited with his grandparents due to the everlasting effect of the Chinese Exclusion Act from more than a century ago. History still affects people today, so please teach AAPI history in school. We don't want to be erased like history, like what almost happened to the tens of thousands of Chinese workers who helped build the transcontinental railroad. We don't want to be segregated and separated out with labels like the model minority. We are not any less American than anyone else, and teaching AI P AAPI history will be akin to recording my name on the big family book, cementing the fact that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are members of the great American family. And speaking of the great American family, shout out to all my volunteers at Read Nation. Read Nation is a student-led nonprofit organization that I co-founded with four of my friends. And our mission is to engage children with reading and learning and in general. We depend on all our volunteers who donate their precious after school time to introduce a passion to learning and just helping kids who don't get enough help at school to just catch up. We are all citizens of this great city and of this great country, and we are all doing our part to keep it great. And just like one of our founders said during the inception meeting of Renation, why not us? Visit renation.org if you would like to learn more about our mission. By the way, I did not forget the governing part of the Confuci of Confucius's quote. Senator John Liu will be joining us later on today, and I will pass the baton to him. After all, I'm only a high school student. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Lin, for your very personal uh, connection to the AAPI history and helping us to see how your history and those of other Asian Americans are so critical uh, to today's public school curriculum in New York. So thank you so much. Um, I want to see if there is, uh, if anyone has any questions, again, please post in the chat. Otherwise we can always post those questions back to the panelists and our guests uh, at the end. Um, so let's see. I, I do have one quick question. Should it be, should we wait until the end or, or, or um, uh, or perhaps uh, ask the question. I could ask one, I have one quick quick question. How about that? Um, so uh, Ms. Lynn, I want to know uh, what, if any, and this could be a very short answer, what if any were your experiences regarding learning about AAPI history in school other than <laughs> what you just mentioned? Is it, I mean, in your very personal experience at Stuyvesant, was it just learning about the Asian, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Japanese internment? Well, that was pretty much the extent of it. And I learned this back in seventh grade when we were doing US history. And my teacher made sure to tell us, he was like, hey, this isn't even part of our curriculum. I'm putting it in here because I feel like this is important, but I also don't have time to teach it because that's not something we are told to teach. And I think that just really shows how little AAPI is being taught in school, that I learned so little, even with my teacher putting in extra effort to make sure we knew at least something. Yeah. So basically, we're, we're leaving it to the, the, to the kindness of, uh, of our teachers to actually insert it in there. Wouldn't it be great just to have it as part of the curriculum? So uh, yeah. thank you, Ms. Lynn, again, for your fantastic um, presentation and your talk. So we'll come back to you with some questions at the end. Uh, so for now, um, I'm going to turn it, uh, defer back to Dr. Song for our next panelist and esteemed guest. Uh, Dr. Song? Thank you, Dr. Ng, and thank you so much, Ms. Lin uh, or Michaela. This is such a wonderful presentation. I think you've seen in the chat, too. People are really, um, really cheering you. I think I also, I, you remind me of the Chinese uh, idiom of um, the next generations or the younger generations are going to surpass us. I see, you, um, I see in you the courage, the hope, and the future of the country, of our community, of the city. It's really um, admirable. Thank you so much. And I think your presentation also perfectly segue us into our next um, um, panelist presentation. 
I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Mr. Joseph Schmidt. Uh, Mr. Schmidt is a senior instructional specialist of the, at the Department of um, Social Studies at DOE, um, New York City. He is also um, a pro, uh, alum from Brooklyn College uh, School of Education. So we are also very proud of you too, Mr. Schmidt, and so um, glad to have you tonight. Um, he will be sharing with us um, what the charge um, from, their, from the current chancellor, Chancellor Banks, is on um, regarding promoting the inclusion and visibility of AAPI students and the community. What are some specific projects they have been working on in this area? And um, what are some current, and maybe some current efforts and actions from the DOE to combat Asian hate? Okay, I'll turn the floor to Ms. Thank you so much, Dr. Song, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you so much to the presenters who preceded me. Um, I'm hoping that I can very much pick up on a lot of the themes that have already been shared, um, because in many ways, these themes are our guiding principles in the work that we're doing in the New York City Department of Education in developing and continuing to bring in AAPI history, but also in thinking about, as a couple of panelists have already spoken about, that it really needs to go beyond US history as well. So I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. Okay, and our work falls under the Hidden Voices curriculum. And I'll speak in a second to what we mean by hidden voices and what the, the kind of the role of that concept is in our work in expanding not just social studies curriculum, but curriculum across content areas. And again, obviously we're speaking about Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in US history and beyond. So I wanna begin by saying kind of, I've heard several really kind of important ideas that really guide our work. Uh, the idea of representation across US history um, in terms of across time, but also across representation in the AAPI communities. And as we speak about hidden voices, one of the things that I'll, I'll get into a little bit is the idea that we wanna begin this work as someone already mentioned, thinking about, for instance, the community in St. Malo down in what is present day Louisiana that developed in the early 18th century. Um, and then think about how this kind of history goes through until the present moment that we live in. The idea that obviously AAPI history is US history and ultimately that in teaching this, we want to really think about how this benefits all students. Um, so what is a hidden voice? A Hidden Voice is a resource. Uh, we have been developing the Hidden Voices materials to be used with our Passport to Social Studies curriculum. Passport to Social Studies is the current curriculum that is taught in about 85% of K-8 schools and many high schools as well. Hidden Voices is a call to action. We believe our students need to see a robust and diverse social studies education robust and diverse representation, and we must seek out and include up underrepresented voices from history in our teaching practice. And finally, Hidden Voices is a tool. Classrooms that are culturally responsive have the power to close the opportunity gap for New York City students, and the authentic use of diverse resources is one aspect of developing culturally responsive and sustaining practices. And so, as I said, our work with Hidden Voices and our work with thinking about AAPI curriculum really is gonna begin with thinking about how this is going to be integrated and used across it within the Passport to Social Studies curriculum. The Passport to Social Studies curriculum is a DOE created and written curriculum. DOE educators have been involved in the process from beginning to end. We also recognize that our work is never done. So even though there are 70 units of social studies curriculum in the Passport to Social Studies. We also have eight units or eight guides within a Civics for All curriculum, and we are continuing to develop the Hidden Voices curriculum. 
and we recognize that we really need to think about bringing in representation across social studies from the beginning of kindergarten all the way through 12th grade participation in government and economics. The Hidden Voices work began about five years ago um, as New York City at its core, an exhibit at the Museum of the City in New York opened. As I said, we really work on the principle that our curriculum is never complete and our work is never done. So we worked with the MCNY to go through. In their exhibit, they have about 70 profiles of New York's New Yorkers through time, and we identified 16 of those individuals to bring into a guide to think about bringing in, again, these underrepresented voices, underrepresented stories into US history curriculum. And we developed a 250 page guide called Hidden Voices, Untold Stories of New York City History. And that development really was not just about bringing the stories in, but showing teachers how they could connect it directly to lessons that were in the Passport to Social Studies curriculum. From there, one of the groups that uh, we have recognized we need to bring in greater representation is the LGBTQ plus community. And thanks to city council support, um, we were able to develop a hidden voices guide and also lesson plans. And just wanna show you that again, thinking about, and this was something I believe Dr. Liu brought up, this idea of the kind of intersection or intersections and intersectionality of history. Even in those guides, you can see that we're bringing in AAPI history into the, the Hidden Voices NYC book, as well as the Hidden Voices LGBTQ book. And so here are four of the profiles that are in those two books. So let's talk a little bit about this work that we are embarking on right now. We are very much responding to a desire and a need we are hearing from. Um, and a story that I just want to tell quickly is about four years ago, we met with a group um, of students, the Asian American Student Advocacy Project, which is connected to um, the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. And at that point, they asked this question. They said, you know, how much representation do you have in the curriculum? And it really forced us to begin thinking about this. And so while we are embarking on this now, we recognize that these questions, this advocacy has been, you know, at present, but also has been there um, and really thinking about how to do this best work and engage the community throughout. We are now engaged in a process to develop this AAPI community, or excuse me, this AAPI curriculum with various stakeholders. Um, so we are working with, at present, um, the director of the Asian Study, Asian American Studies uh, program at Hunter, Vivian Mui. Uh, she is leading a team of scholars, uh, including uh, Dr. Nay Nai at Columbia, as well as um, folks from throughout the country to develop a Hidden Voices AAPI guide. It is designed, as I said earlier, to very much be integrated and to be a significant part of the Passport to Social Studies curriculum. So throughout, we will show how teachers can do this work. Um, I really thought, uh, Ms. Lynn, when you mentioned kind of the time to teach, one of the things we wanna make sure teachers understand is that it's not about the time to teach, it's about how important it is to teach this. And so they need to make time, but also how can we best help them to see where to bring this into the curriculum? Again, throughout a year's worth of curriculum, but also across K to 12. In this process, we will engage in the with the community and with various stakeholders to get feedback, both in terms of piloting some of the work, but also in hearing as we develop from the community what really needs to be there to do this work best. I already took some notes down actually from, from this meeting that I want to integrate into the work that we're doing. Uh, and then it's really important that through the commitment of the new administration under Chancellor Banks, we will collaborate throughout with AAPI partners and be responsive to the voices of our community as we embark on this work. A couple of the community partners that we're already working with um, are, and I think actually this group has already been mentioned, the Asian American Education Project. Um, we've been speaking with, and actually Dr. Kuo 
has been doing some work in professional development and we're very happy to bring him into the work of developing the project, um, the Hidden Voices project for us. We are in ongoing, I believe I see Kaveri in the audience, we're in ongoing conversations with CACF um, to really think about how to do this work best, but also how to collect and gather feedback from different community partners and community groups. And then we're also working with a small but really powerful organization, the Education Project, who's going to help us to kind of ground this work and ensure that we show those connections to the curriculum throughout K-12. So I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen. I lost my my, oh, can someone else take the sharing screen off? Because I seem to have lost my control. Um, Lisa or Norman, can you? I don't think we can. Just oh. look on the top. There should yeah, be no, a no, red it button. Yeah, no, no. I know the, the bar is, it seems to have disappeared. I came to this one time when I was teaching, and suddenly I couldn't find it. Yeah, no. Um, if someone else is one of there, the uh, I, I presenters, found it. I was going to say you Thank can you. knock them out. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Schmidt. Um, it's it's very encouraging to see all these um, ongoing and um, efforts from DOE, and it's it's um, as I can tell, it's it's recent since five years ago, because my my older one is graduating from elementary school. And I, um, I am sorry to say that I, I wish she had learned some of the, you know, the content that um, Mr. Schmidt has presented. It would be so wonderful. We live right by Chinatown in Manhattan. Um, they visited the Tenement Museum, learned about the Jewish history and learned about, you know, some of the local histories in New York but she knows nothing about the history of Chinatown where she lives. Um, so I really hope to see, you know, the, the materials that have been mentioned um, will be fused into the curriculum in the near future. Um, I think in the interest of time, maybe we can save all the questions towards the end and then have um, Senator Liu who has um, joined us already, um, who, uh, talk to us first. Um, Dr. Song, I'll turn the floor to you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Song. So uh, Senator John Liu is our last guest today, and we're thrilled to have him here. Uh, Senator Liu, uh, welcome. I'm Dr. Norman Eng at Brooklyn College, and I thank you on behalf of our institution and our esteemed panelists and attendees for joining us today for our virtual panel slash discussion on a path forward to unity and diversity AAPI history in school curriculum. So I have a very simple question for you, which is, can you tell us a little bit about your Asian American history bill? What is the bill about and why did you propose it? Senator Liu? Thanks very much, Dr. Ng, for uh, the, the, the kind introduction. I wanna thank Professor Lee for making the arrangements and inviting me to this very special program. I uh, apologize that I was not able to join at the beginning, so I'm not sure exactly what was covered already, although I have been since on since six o'clock, which was uh, the agreed upon time. And, and also, I apologize that I'm doing this from the car. I, I thought I'd be able to get back to my queen's office uh, in time, but uh, we're not there yet because traffic from Albany in the afternoon is not not very kind. In any event, um, I, I'd like to back up a little bit. And I, again, I apologize if I'm talking about things that have already been discussed. Obviously, we have had two years of a uh, really bad experience, a bad experience with, with people getting sick and dying with this global pandemic. And as Asian Americans, also, unfortunately, people getting hurt and in some cases dying as well from this uh, unprecedented onslaught of anti-Asian hate. I think, well, I'll speak for myself, I've certainly been through my share of, uh, of um, hate and, and discrimination, uh, but I thought that was a long time ago. And I, you know, it's 2020 
2022 or 2020, a couple of years ago, thought that was kind of in the past. And then of course, uh, the, the sheer racism reared its ugly head once again. And we have seen everything from the president or the former president talking about the China virus and Kung flu to these, I mean, I don't think anybody has kept up with the number of videos that have surfaced on social media and other reports of bias incidents and, and vicious attacks against Asian Americans. So this is, you know, this is the impetus behind the, my bill. In order to combat anti-Asian hate, there's no one solution or magic bullet that's going to fix the problem. It's going gonna, it's gonna to require a range of, of actions by government and also by individuals and communities. On the part of government, we need to we need to have law enforcement hold attackers and people who are uh, are guilty of these kinds of crimes and incidents, hold them hold them accountable, and uh, that means prosecution and uh, and sentencing that's appropriate so that we don't allow there to be some kind of message that government will just turn a blind eye when Asian Americans are attacked in such vicious manners. Uh, we also recognize that some of the individuals that have been involved in, in these very graphic attacks are mentally ill and possibly homeless as well. So government does need to direct resources to, uh, to help people with mental health problems, as well as return some of the resources for homeless people. But we also have to look at uh, the, the, the infrastructure that is present in our communities. Uh, that infrastructure often is not just provided by government, but it's actually even better provided by community-based organizations. These community-based organizations have been around for decades, but uh, compared to the need that's out there in AAPI communities, they are operating on, on very, very tight budgets and certainly not able to help all the people in our communities that that do that have the need, so when when people are not helped, when it comes to uh, food insecurity or housing insecurity, economic insecurity, educational insecurity, that makes the entire community collectively more vulnerable to attacks, to uh, to bigotry, to discrimination, and so uh, we've also gotten a lot more resources at all different levels of government to provide funding and technical assistance and legal support to these organizations that, quite frankly, many of the people in our community trust more than government. And then finally, the long-term solution has to be education. Education, uh, because people, you know, they still, they don't know a whole lot about Asian Americans, sad to say. The, I think we can all agree that the, the I, well, I'll, again, I'll speak for myself. I don't think that people are born to hate others. I think hate comes out of uh, a combination of fear and ignorance, fear because we've had this global pandemic that's affected everybody's lives in one way or another and, and ignorance because, you know, it's easy to blame people or community that you just don't know a whole lot about. And so, uh, you know, it must be these Asians, it must be these, you know, the, the new anti-Asian slur is carrier. When people get, get called, oh, you know, you must be a carrier or you stay away from me, they, they mean carrier of COVID-19. It's, uh, it's easy to blame people you don't understand. And so that's why, you know, I, I looked at some of the textbooks that are still being used. Unfortunately, it's, it's not, not much has changed since I was in public school like 100 years ago when you had, you had a reference to the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. You have a reference to Japanese being put in concentration camps during World War II. Uh, you know, Vincent Chin, which was a milestone, a pivotal milestone in Asian American history, is never mentioned. And when it, when it is mentioned, they don't even address the whole 
whole topic. They just talk about, uh, you know, an, an Asian American being brutally killed. They don't ever talk about the government response, which, in my opinion, was far worse than the vicious killing itself. They don't talk about 9-11, how South Asians were scapegoated and viciously attacked in those times also. I, there's just so little. And so when people don't understand what we are, then, you know, then it gravi- then our identity becomes one of two things. We are either the model minority, meaning we're all rich. We all, you know, get straight A's in, in school. We don't need any help. In fact, all other minority groups should look to us and try to be like us. So, the, you know, on the one hand, we're model minorities. And then on the other hand, we're, you know, we're perpetual foreigners. We can't, we're, we're not real Americans. We can't really be Americans. Uh, I, I speak at so many AAPI Heritage Month events. I always talk about how people, you know, I mean, I'm, not, I'm no spring chicken anymore. People are still complimenting me on my ability to speak English. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't all of you take that as a compliment? Or when they ask you, where, where are you from? Uh, you know, they won't take New York as an answer. Uh, no, no, where are, you, where are you really from? Or, you know, sometimes I, I, I go to these fancy receptions and, you know, just complete strangers trying to make, I guess they're trying to be friendly. They feel, they always feel like uh, um, they need to tell me how much they love sashimi. You know, it's, <laughs> so, it, you know, it, and, and there, was a, there was a poll last year of 2000 Americans asking them, who, which Asian American do you know well? Like, wh- who, who is a well-known Asian American? And only 42% of the respondents could name a single Asian American. And the, the most common response was Jackie Chan. Now, you know, I, I like, <laughs> I kind of like Jackie Chan. He's a little goofy for my taste, but whatever. You know, he's, he's well-known, but the guy's not Asian American. He's guy. He's from Hong Kong. He's Asian. He's certainly not Asian American. And then the second most, uh, the second most common response was Bruce Lee. I mean, you know, I I actually am a Bruce Lee fan, but he's been dead for thirty years. So you know, it just it's just another like such a, a clear example of how. People just don't know who Asian Americans are. And when that happens, it's really easy to blame your fears, the problems on this group, which is why we need Asian American studies, Asian American history taught in our public schools so that we may not be able to get through to people in my generation, but at least we start having people understand what Asian Americans are, what they, what we represent, uh, and I'm not talking about, again, I'm not talking about fan dances or line dances or beating drums or doing Kung Fu. Okay. We're talking about, uh, the experience that we have had helping build this nation, helping build the state of New York, you know, talking about the, our experiences in CUNY for the last 50 years, how Asian Americans, especially the faculty at Brooklyn college have built CUNY into the world renowned institution that it is today, how the city of New York would not be anything like what it is today. You know, even even like my hometown of Flushing. Well, actually, I guess it's not my hometown because that's not where I am really, really from because because I was born in Taiwan. But, uh, you know, people people mention Flushing as, oh, yeah, I know Flushing. It's so, you know, they have good food. I mean, I really hate when Flushing, which is the, the biggest concentration of economic activity outside Manhattan. It's, the, it's a financial center that is only dwarfed by Wall Street. You know, we've got higher education institutions in downtown Flushing. Uh, it's, but it, you know, it gets marginalized as just a, a place where they have, they have some nice restaurants. It's, uh, it, it's, you know, it's particularly galling to me. So, so we need to, to uh, make sure that uh, 
future generation generations, particularly starting with our school kids, have some opportunity to learn about the Asian American experience. And I think uh, somebody said earlier that uh, even their own children don't have a chance to learn about Asian American history. Uh, and that's true for my son also, who, you know, he, he's, he's just getting out of the school system while he's just, he's about to graduate from college, but he didn't get a whole lot of Asian American studies in public schools either. So, uh, so that's, that's what, that's the genesis, a really long drawn out explanation of what my bill is. The bill ex itself is pretty simple. It's not complicated. It just tell, it, it directs the state education department to put together some materials and some curriculum and push it out to all the school districts throughout the state of New York. And then to monitor what those school districts are actually doing to infuse Asian American studies into public school curricula. Doesn't mean that it has to be taught all the time. Doesn't mean it necessarily has to be taught every week or, or even every year, but at least it should be integrated to, into uh, the, the public school curriculum. So that, that's what the bill does. Um, it's, the, the status of it is that, you know, it's still making its way, um, but the fact that we've introduced it into legislation has already, uh, has already gotten school districts all throughout the state of New York to at least start thinking about it, even if, even if they may not yet be mandated to provide that AAPI history, that they, it's something that they need to start considering. And so, you know, we have, we have about 900 school districts around the state of New York. New York City is one school district. Uh, obviously, it's by far the largest, not only in the state of New York, but in the country. And so I'm glad to see Mr. Schmidt talking about what the DOE is doing. Uh, this is something that I expect uh, Mayor Adams to announce in short order, uh, certainly within this month, which is special to us, AAPI Heritage Month. And, uh, and so we'll see what the city of New York can uh, deliver in advance of a statewide mandate. If any place should do it, it certainly should be the city of New York where AAPI population is now approaching. Uh, in a few years, it'll be up to 20%. We're, we're clearly, clearly the fastest growing community here in New York and elsewhere for that matter. So uh, let me end it at that. And I, I don't know, uh, Professor Lee or Dr. Ng, if you, you want me to take any questions, I'm happy to do so. Well, thank you so much first for, for answering that question, Senator Liu. I, I did want to know if, because we actually have someone in the chat who posted a link um, to the New York State Senate website uh, to support that, uh, for those who want to support it. But can you think of maybe other ways? Are there other ways that community members could support, show their support uh, for this very important bill? What can they do? They can talk to their legislators, both the state Senate as well as the assembly, and everybody can find who their representatives are very easily also on the Senate website or just Google. Google, you know, who is my state assembly member? Who is my state senator? And send them a note or an email or just call them or tag them on social media and say, hey, we need you to support and pass this bill. Um, we, there are also lots of petitions being circulated, so a petition works also, but I feel like um, a very effective way to, uh, to get to the legislators is by sending them an, an email or, uh, or a letter and combining that with a phone call. And so that, that way they, they know they have constituents and, and also, you know, talk about the, the neighborhood where you live or, uh, or if you're comfortable, mention the, the street that you live on. Sounds good. Uh, that's very sound advice. So hopefully, hopefully uh, we can try to send uh, uh, either email them as well as follow with a phone call. I think that's great advice. Um, get them two times because uh, one time is not always enough. So, uh, Senator, yeah. thank you so much. Is, is there anything else that you want to add? 
Yeah, I mean, you have another three hours. We could go all night. <laughs> well, here's what. So what we'll do is that um, uh, again, thank you so much, Senator Lou. What we're going to do is that it's about six thirty right now, Eastern, and um, this event ends at around at seven o'clock. And so we'd probably spend the last, let's say, fifteen twenty minutes or so doing a Q and A with you as well as the other esteemed panelists, um, and turn it over to uh, the attendees and see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, they could either um, post. It. I see some questions in the chat chat as well as unmute themselves. Uh, we have about uh, close to 100 people over here today, so it's great to see so many attending. Um, and so um, either Dr. Song or, or, or Dr. Lee, uh, I'm not sure how you want to do that, but I think the best way is just to maybe um, open up the floor or what, what do you think is the best way to do that? Um, I see that Dr. Liu has raised her hand. Maybe we can- um, Yeah, let's use a raise hand. And, and in the meantime, I'll also check the, 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 the chat as well. Yes, I will be checking the chat as well. Dr. Liu, please go All on. right, I'll jump in. Hello, Senator Liu. Thanks for oh, your, uh, uh, thanks for proposing the bill. So I'm a member of Makers Visible New Jersey. I'm also on the panel. And so we really, we did a lot of work uh, push the uh, New Jersey legislation to pass last year. And I think, uh, uh, Dr. Nin was asking how we can uh, make it to happen. I want to also share a little bit our, of our experiences. So, so one thing is we, because Asian Americans, we are a group, we're not used to uh, civic engagement. So we, what we did is we provide a lot of email templates and also with uh, translations. The letters need to be written in, in English. Certainly you can be written in Chinese or other languages, but the we did a lot of email templates or phone templates. And another thing that we learned is because uh, a lot of, like in Chinatown, your parents may not be US citizens, so they don't feel like they're part of it. But we told them if your children are US citizens, this is about your children's education rights. So you can still reach out to your uh, representatives. That's just something I want to share as a- Thank you so much, Dr. Liu, yeah. Um, uh, maybe I can just have a quick comment about Dr. Mm -hmm. Liu's, uh, what, what she said. Uh, we, we are very cognizant of uh, New Jersey passing this legislation as well as the state of New York. I have uh, asked the state education de department to compare you know, what happened in New Jersey and Illinois and why the structure in New York State makes it more difficult for us to pass this kind of legislation. Uh, and the short answer is that um, in, in the state of New York, uh, there is a significant difference from those other states in, in that we have a body called the Board of Regents, which, uh, which has, has historically, you know, for, for 200 years, been the body that guides educational policy in the state of New York. And, uh, and, and they, are, they are meant to be apolitical, meaning they're generally retired, uh, have some intensive educational background and not, not looking for anything further or run for office. So, uh, so education is really uh, their, their goal. They set policy and uh, we, we, the, the, at least for, for, uh, for modern memory, the last 60 or 70 years, there have been very few, if any, instances where policy, educational policy and curriculum has been legislated. That's why, you know, that's why my bill would be a legislative mandate for educational policy. It would be a, a departure from decades of precedent. Uh, similarly, African-American legislators have also been demanding for the last 25 years the inclusion of African-American history in public school curricula. And they have also not been able to pass that law, mainly because the precedent has been set that, uh, that we, we, the people who detract from my bill and the bill that has been proposed by African-American legislators is that that, that we shouldn't politicize educational policy and leave it up to the regents to decide. So uh, while people who may not support my bill or similar bills like this uh, don't, they say they don't, they, they don't disagree that AAPI history should be taught in our public schools. 
Uh, they disagree with legislating it through via mandate uh, as opposed to uh, letting the regents make that decision. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, they will point that there are about 200 bills outstanding that, uh, and, you know, they're all, they all precede my bill that have legislative mandates on curriculum in New York schools. So that is one of the issues. I, I don't accept that as uh, an excuse. And so we're pushing forward, but uh, I, my understanding is that the border regions is something that is more unique to the state of New York, as opposed to uh, what the experience and uh, what was able to be done in New Jersey and in Illinois. Okay, thank you so much, Senator Liu. And uh, so let's see if we have some other questions here. Um, Dean Bedford has, um, has raised her hand. Okay. Go ahead, Dean Bedford. Oh, thank you, Lulu. And I, I know I definitely want us to get to the questions in the chat, um, but I uh, wanted to introduce myself, Senator Liu. I'm April Bedford. I'm the Dean of the School of Education here at Brooklyn College. And, you know, you talked about um, the regents supposedly being apolitical and, you know, um, New York typically not. Uh, mandating yeah. curriculum through legislation. I just taught, I just guest taught a class on Monday when I teach it's children's literature. And so I teach a lot about the importance of, of all students seeing themselves reflected in literature. And currently as of about two weeks ago, there are 26 states that have mandated what cannot be taught in their states. And I would venture to say that in those states, probably exactly what you and all of the panelists here are advocating um, to have happen in New York would be exactly what they're opposing in many states around the country. And that's, that's very scary to me. Um, I'm also teaching a freshman seminar and my students made presentations yesterday and I always learned so much from my students and one group presented about some statistics currently in the New York City Department of Ed. And they, one of the statistics was about the ethnic breakdown. I'm sorry, I have a toddler here, <laughs> but um, was about the okay. ethnic breakdown as of last year. And um, they cited white, Asian, black and Hispanic groups and uh, white students were the smallest population in New York City DOE. I don't know how much of the curriculum, particularly in history, is focused on white students, but I would venture to guess that it's a huge number, in no way proportional to the actual ethnic representation in the schools. So I, I'm so thrilled at what you've proposed, what the New York City DOE is doing, what uh, Dr. Liu has done. Um, both at NYU and in New Jersey. And also we had a wonderful student from Stuyvesant High School, Michaela Lynn, who talked about her own experience as a student in New York school. So I'm very encouraged, but I'm also very glad to be in New York given what the climate is over throughout the country right now. You're, and I'd say you're absolutely right, Ms. Bedford, that, uh, you know, critical race theory, that's still, that's, the regents debate that every single time they meet. And we have so many discussions about that and, and the controversy surrounding it, uh, which, you know, that it's been, it has been a very divisive issue. And that, that does enter into our discussions about, about my bill and other sim similar curriculum related bills. But again, you know, short of, we, we keep pushing to pass it, this legislative mandate we also strongly encourage school districts, especially the city of New York, to proceed with their own plan. Uh, you know, I will mention, and Dr. Liu was, was kind enough to, to talk about how you were able to follow the, the African-American studies bill and the LGBTQ studies bill. Uh, we, don't, we don't have something to follow in the, in the state of New York. Uh, but in the city of New York, it was just last September where the city, the mayor and the then chancellor uh, announced that there was a plan to infuse African-American studies into all New York City public schools. And so, you know, I, 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 
I have made it very clear that I don't see why they can't do the same thing with Asian American studies. And if they want to do it with Latinx studies, great. But Asian American studies needs to be in there, especially at this moment in history. Okay, thank you, uh, Senator Liu. Uh, why don't we take some questions from the chat? There's quite a few questions there. Uh, there's one question from Charlie Wong, uh, and his question is, when does Senator Liu predict that the bill will be passed? Uh, Charlie, if I could predict that, I, I'd probably be sipping cocktails on a beach somewhere warm. I can't predict that. Uh, we're pushing forward as, as quickly as possible. As I said, there are similar bills mandating curriculum that uh, that go back 25 years and they're still trying to see the light of day. I do expect that we will pass this kind of legislation sometime soon. Uh, I'm putting all my all my eggs into the education basket on this bill. And again, it this is this is timely. It's needed at this point in history. But I, I wouldn't be able to tell you a, a date. It also it also is incumbent upon, you know, the, I was asked the question, what could all of you or people you know do to help the bill? Again, talking to your legislators, invariably some of them will be opposed to this kind of mandate, not because they don't want Asian American history taught in public schools, but they oppose this kind of mandate that would break decades of precedent. And he actually had a uh, second part to his question, which was, uh, does the DOE have a schedule? And perhaps this is perhaps for the, all the panelists. Um, does the DOE have a schedule for the program? Uh, when will the materials be put in the kids' books or curriculum? Any thoughts on that? And this perhaps is for Senator Liu as well as other panelists. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't want to hog up all the airtime here. Uh, I, I know my fellow panelists uh, have a lot to say. I will say that uh, I expect the mayor to make an announcement this month, this year's AAPI History Month or Heritage Month, and something to be begun in the new school year coming this September. Uh, whether all of this can be in books or new books ordered for history lessons, uh, that's going to take some time to roll out. I don't think they're going to have all of that by September but certainly a clear plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Song, I know that we have some raised hands. Um, um, I just want to see if uh, Mr. Schmidt um, has, wants to add anything to that. Sure, um, I will start by saying we are hammering out the details um, for the schedule for both development and implementation. I also just wanna thank Senator Liu for his advocacy and his leadership as well as thanking everyone for their commitment to kind of bringing in these resources. I think it's important to note that we will be doing work to develop this curriculum and also ensure that all teachers are trained in how to implement it. Um, importantly, as part of this goal, uh, to ensure that these materials are implemented K-12 throughout the DOE, we will ensure that all superintendents receive an overview as well as kind of clarity on what the professional well learning will be um, throughout the process of both development and implementation. Uh, we have begun to develop some materials and make some materials available. Um, if you go to, and I can drop into the chat, um, the DOE website, there is actually a resource guide for AAPI Heritage Month. Um, that is available on the website. On that, you will find, for instance, um, we have in the, uh, what's called the Citywide Digital Library, a AAPI Heritage Month collection of eBooks that any teacher or student um, can access using their email address. And in that collection, we also have a very large collection of George Takei's book, They Call Us Enemy, and we actually just had the, the pleasure of my colleague interviewed him um, uh, recently on a panel to talk about the development of the book and why kind of it's so both timely and important now. So some of these resources are already available. The other thing I just do want to mention that I think is important is when we develop the Hidden Voices materials, we want to make sure that they are available not just to New York City teachers, but that they are available throughout both the state and the country. So if you go to 
we teach NYC, you can see the LGBTQ plus materials, for instance, um, those materials can be downloaded and used virtually anywhere in the world. Um, so uh, we will do the same in the work that we're going to do for the AAPI curriculum. Um, the other thing I, I just do want to quickly mention as part of what we're hammering out is we want to make sure that this is multidisciplinary. So not just lessons for social studies, K-12, but also really thinking about lessons for ELA, math, science, and the arts. So you can expect that work to be part of the plan. Um, and as Senator Liu mentioned, that announcement will be forthcoming this month. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Joe. Um, so I can see that we do have raised hands. It probably makes sense just to kind of hear from those we, we haven't heard, um, as well as we'll, we'll try to get everyone as much as possible within the time that we have. Um, I see uh, Iris Liu, uh, you have your hand up. Do you have a question? You, if you can unmute yourself. Yes, I do have a question. So I'm also 11th grader attending public school in New York State. And I just wanted to talk about my thoughts on why I think that men, men, men dating API teaching material is really important. And I think schools serve the purpose of preparing students for integration to society. And I don't think that can be achieved without them recognizing that our community, the API community, which is large and incredibly involved in both the past history and present history of America society, so I think this bill is really important because laws and curriculums aren't set in stone. There have been, you know, legislations that adjust curriculums. I think that this is equally, if not more important, proven by recent experiences that we've had with the pandemic and just people thinking that we're perpetual foreigners, we're a community that hasn't contributed enough to the American society to be recognized in the history books. And yes, so I think that we should definitely take action to fix this. And I would also like to ask all the panelists, I know that we've been discussing on how we can show support for this bill and the integration of API history in uh, New York curriculum through emailing or calling our local senators. But I also wanted to know what are some things that students can do to contribute to this cause especially students who are being impacted by a lack of AAPI history teaching in our schools right now, who might not be well informed about this cause or students being subjected to bias or stereotypes that might come from this problem. And so, like I mentioned before, a lot of Asian American students who aren't very well informed on AAPI history, I think especially the achievements of our community, there has been well, limited material on Japanese intern camps and our economic contributions and nativism subjected to us. But we don't know a lot about the great figures of Asian American history was contributed to much more than just the economic industry. So what are some things that students can do? Maybe we could encourage our teachers, talk to them personally to try to convince them to include additional teaching material in either English or social studies, or maybe we can talk to our classmates or friends to raise awareness on this issue on a much more personal level. Iris, I, I really want to commend you for asking that question. I think what you did today is, you know, a very important first step and very, very crucial. Um, it's, it's going to be a great model for all the students. And it's, it's a model for our adults too, who are trying to you know, change our um, education for the better, yeah. But okay, for the panelists, yeah. Can I suggest that Iris, you, you circulate a petition among your fellow classmates at school uh, in support of the teaching of AAPI history to, to be given to your principal as well as uh, to support uh, my bill to mandate this at the state level and send it to the state education commissioner and get and send me a copy of it. Of course, um, would it be okay if I post a petition link in chat? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Is there any other panelist who wants to jump in? Um, one kind of 
maybe a little bit unorthodox suggestion um, is really talk to your teachers about kind of the materials and the media that you want to see the curriculum in. Um, I took my screen off blur partly because my colleague just left, but also to show if you can see behind me, we've been developing comic books and we're actually uh, already in the process of developing comic books to be a part of the AAPI curriculum. We're working with Greg Pak, who is a, a writer um, of really wonderful comics, uh, who's working on our first comic, which will be part of this series. But this came from hearing from students that they really wanted to see not just kind of traditional prose text or it, but really wanted to see comic books. And so we brought that into, and it's been really a charge of our work from the beginning of the development of the curriculum is to make sure that comics are a part of the media that students see and use to, to learn about history or you know, civics or other things. So I would say really advocate, you know, if you wanna see a particular type of media, advocate for that media. Okay. Thank you so much uh, uh, for, for suggesting that. Um, I think, uh, and please uh, tell me if I am wrong, that we are coming to a close. I do see there's one more one question in the in the chat, if we have time, and then perhaps I'll uh, we'll turn it back to Dr. Lee. Uh, there's one question in the chat uh, from Shino Tanikawa, who asked questions of all the who, who's asking a question to all the panelists. How are you contextualizing AAPI history in the broader US history that involves Black history, Latinx history, and Indigenous history, among others? Are you incorporating solidarity movement and how our history intertwines with histories of other oppressed peoples? Well, I can say a couple of things, though I'm not really an expert, but just based on our experiences, right? So uh, first of all, I think in the history, there always has been a lot of solidarity between the Asian American community and the black community. Uh, like in the 1960s, there's a, if you actually look at the history, there, there's a, a lot of actions, uh, activities going on. Like the, 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 the third world movement, which is basically a coalition of Asian black and the, uh, Chicano and the Indigenous American Students uh, Coalition, and another famous uh, a Asian American civil rights figure, Grace Lee Boggs. She's the uh, wife of James Boggs and uh, an activist and feminism. So, and there's also uh, Yuri Kochiyama, and she's an ally of Malcolm X. Um, examples like that, there are actually no, no shortage of examples like that. And I would also offer, you know, there's also in terms of people's experience, right? That's a, recently I watched a documentary, it's called a Deep, Deep Sauce, uh, Far East. It's about a family. So it's in the, in the settings of right after emancipation, a lot of black slaves were uh, uh, freed. So then there's a shortage of labor. So a Chinese labor filled in. So then there's this, in the Mississippi, there's this hidden uh, or forgotten history about Blacks and the Chinese uh, uh, lives. So, so there are documentaries about that. And it, there's a, another book, a historical fiction called The Downstairs Girls, uh, written by Stacey Lee. She's a great Asian American uh, a historical fiction writer. So that book is also about a Chinese girl, a mixed girl, so she's like a, a he, he, you know, she's a daughter of a Chinese man and a, and a white woman. So she, her identity needs to be stay hidden. And then her experience uh, was uh, intertwined with a, a black girl and, and a white family. So there's a lot of materials we can use to talk about cross race and, uh, and with the Latinx. And there's also, you can put us on the framework of the colonial, or, or right, the, the colonial framework lens and uh, the uh, think about expanding the Western Eurocentered view by, by looking at Asian American Asian experiences in Latinx history. Yeah, so so that's something I can comment on that. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Okay. I mean, I can briefly interject that uh, that that is that is important we have a lot of commonality with other communities of color 
uh, but we have to be part of the equation first. And so that's, you know, it, 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 I would say that's almost like the next level because we haven't even permeated the, the primary level, which is to just get Asian American, Asian American history included, you know, impactful Asian Americans in American history. And I want to thank the, she know yeah, she is one of those learned individuals as part of our board of regents. Sounds good. Uh, so I noticed that we're coming close to 7 p.m. I want to make sure to respect everyone's time here. So I thought perhaps, and as much as I do see another question and another hand raise, I'm afraid that we're coming to that closing time. Uh, so I want to pass this to Dr. Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee, I don't know if you wanted to um, to to close it or, or what's next. Hi, I just want to make a comment. I think you know it. It is very important. We have uh, John Liu is leading this uh, for the legislation, and we have DOE working on the you know the curriculum, how to integrate the AAPI history in curriculum. But I also want to say that you know for the uh, teacher educators here or for the teachers yourself, you still have so much to do, you know, in the meantime, because the Asian American, the images, the experiences are so invisible. I mean, like as uh, Dean uh, Bedford said, like when you choose a book, when you teach science, you know, just be a little intentional to search for the Asian American experiences. Maybe just in your lesson slide to insert a slide with with Asian face. You know the Asian kids will be so happy to see themselves. So I think you know, like as a teacher, as a teacher educator, you just can do. You know, just like in your control, just do a little bit, be more, a little more intentional. I think you we will make a change from there. That is what I want to see. Thank you. I think that's and to. Uh, Dean Bedford. Sorry, did I miss something? Uh, no, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. I um, was actually just putting in the chat. Um, I just want to thank all of our panelists. We learned so much from each of you, and it was so interesting to hear your individual perspectives and the work each of you are doing individually, and then how they all. Um, coalesce and are, you know, we're really all on the same page and moving forward in the same direction. So thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Um, we're very honored that you were, that you did that for us. I also want to thank all of the Brooklyn College faculty who planned and um, carried out this amazing event and particularly Dr. Lee and Dr. Song and Dr. Ng. Um, it was just fantastic and I'm so thrilled that it's recorded because I want to share it with the entire Brooklyn College community. And finally, I want to thank all of our um, audience for attending. I know everyone learned a lot. I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. I know this sparked lots of thinking and I hope you will go back to your classes and have conversations with your classmates and your professors. And, um, and especially for all of our teacher candidates, um, just as Dr. Lee said, be thinking right now about what you can do in your own classroom when you have one um, to uh, incorporate AAPI history. Thank you so much. This has just been a wonderful, wonderful event and a great celebration, I think. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, everyone.